Amen, church. Uh, we continue our, our series this morning in the book of Hebrews. We come to chapter number 13. And so I want to invite you to get out your take home where you can open up a Bible and follow along. Um, the focus of our study this morning is chapter 13, verses 1 to 6. Uh, for the sake of context, I'm going to actually begin reading from back in chapter 12, verse 28. So let's hear the reading of God's word. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus, let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Let brotherly love continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Remember those who are in prison as though in prison with them and those who are mistreated, since you also are in the body. Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. Keep your life free from the love of money, and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not fear. What can man do to me? Amen. Well, after I got out of the military, uh, my wife, Deborah, and I, uh, we moved back to Florida, and uh, we began kind of searching online to see what, what church we might attend. And so uh, I, I visited a number of church websites, and there's one in particular uh, that, that stood out to me. Uh, I knew something was going to be different about this church because when the page came up, uh, reggae music started playing. And uh, I don't have anything against reggae music, uh, but uh, there was a tagline off on the side, and what, what it said was, this ain't your grandmother's church. Now, I didn't know all that that meant, but uh, I assumed from that that it was not going to be ordinary. Something about it was going to be different, but what it would not be was ordinary. And um, it seems today uh, that no one really wants to be ordinary. A number of years ago, theologian and cultural commentator Michael Horton said, who wants to be that ordinary person who lives in an ordinary town, is a member of an ordinary church, has ordinary friends, and works an ordinary job? And he went on to observe that he's never seen a, a parent put on the back of their car a sign that says, my child is an ordinary student <laughs> at Bubbling Book Elementary. And it's, you know, it made me think, why such a strong aversion to the ordinary? I'm inclined to agree with what the poet Wallace Stevens said when he noted that uh, in our day, we, we suffer from what he called the malady of the quotidian. That's a word that means the, the mundane, the, the everydayness to life. Uh, we, don't want, we don't want to be ordinary. Everything has to be awesome, exciting, and amazing. And as Horton concluded in his article, he said, and all of this should be something that could be managed, measured, and maintained because we've got to live up to our Facebook profile. Now, <laughs> um, as I put that together, I thought some people in the church might say, wow, Joe, turning 40 has really done a number on you. Uh, you, you know, you sound like an older person complaining about kids these days. Um, well, no, but, but I begin this way because what strikes me about these opening six verses of chapter 13 here is how ordinary it sounds. Uh, considering all that's come before, I, I don't think any of us would have predicted that this is what the Holy Spirit would have inspired this pastor and writer uh, to teach us about how to apply the truths that have gone before. This is a bruised and battered congregation in the first century that's being hounded by the Roman government. And we know from history that not only was it not going to get better, it got worse. They've lost jobs, houses, family, and friends, and money. And because that's the case, last week's message, I think, would, would make sense to us because he called them to rehearse the gospel to say, yes, you're suffering, things are really bad, but eternity is coming. God's going to make all things new. I mean, that makes sense to us. But now, as he comes to this part of the letter, as he begins to draw to a close and he tells them what it is that he wants them to focus on as they make their way to the city of God, he says, I want to talk about church family with you. I want to talk to you about how to treat people. I want to talk to you about marriage. I want to talk to you about how you handle your finances. I want to talk to you about uh, contentment and trust in God. I don't think if it was us today, we would have thought that's how he would have concluded this 
letter. It, we, we would have expected something more exciting, you know, do this, go there, achieve that, start this ministry, uh, hold a conference, form an alliance, go to the local courthouse and protest and demand that the Roman government protect your rights. And of course, obviously record it and post it online. I mean, did it even happen if you don't do that? No, he doesn't do that. He says, we're going to talk about family. Talk about church family. We talk about caring for the poor. We talk, talk about showing hospitality, being content, and trusting in God. But seen through the lens of Scripture, all of these activities and, and the postures of the heart that give rise to them are anything but ordinary because they reflect the practical, everyday ways that the gospel reorients our lives. But to see that, we've got to remind ourselves of the larger storyline of Scripture. Let me show you that. We need to remember that we are, by nature, sinners. And as Paul Tripp likes to say, the DNA of sin is selfishness. Do you know that? He says that, that sin in its fundamental form is antisocial. I don't know if you know that. Because what sin does is it reduces all of our concerns down to my wants, my needs, and my feelings. So that if you think about it, we, re we, we, we really don't have a lot of time for other people. Again, I'm going to continue quoting Tripp here. He says that by nature as sinners, what we tend to do is, is view people as either vehicles or obstacles. Right? A vehicle meaning you help me get what I want. So if you help me get what I want, then I like you at least for the time being. But, but if you're an obstacle to what I want, then I'm spontaneously angry. So therefore, uh, either way, it, it's all about me. That, that's who we are by nature. We need to know that about ourselves. And if you don't know that about yourself, uh, see how you respond in a time of trial. But then, through the preaching of the gospel and the mysterious working of the Holy Spirit, God grants you new life. That's what we call the new birth. You are born again. And when that happens, God gives you a new heart. You trust in Christ. He justifies you, and he begins to transform you. And what we're reading today, what we're studying in these six verses are some of the very practical ways that God transforms us. So the broader redemptive point here this morning is quite glorious, and that is the fact that God is committed to remaking us in the image of his son. Praise God for that. So that, whereas prior to our conversion... We mainly only cared about ourselves. We had no desire to please God. Yes, we viewed other people as either vehicles or obstacles. But now, because he's transformed our hearts, we actually find greater joy and satisfaction in living for God and serving others. Some of you are saying, really? <laughs> Not that we've reached a state of sinless perfection, but that in some measure, we can actually say that we delight to serve God and we, we delight to serve others. And because that's the case, that's evidence that the kingdom of God has broken into your life and transformed you. And because that's happened, what's taken place? Your beliefs have changed, your values have changed, and your actions have changed. So what we're looking at here again in these verses are, are the fact that these are some of the activities that God is working into our hearts. And because, this is the main point I want us to see, because they spring from our trust in the promises of God, they glorify him. Now, I belabor this point because I want us to know that all of the ethical applications in Scripture or the, the practical exhortations, which is what this text is, the, the, we need to know that they are always grounded in the doctrinal foundations that have come before. You have to know that. The commandments of Scripture do not hang in midair. So what we're reading today, or anytime you get to the therefore do this in the Bible, you need to know that it is not that God is saying to us, do these things because this will be really nice. That, that's, not how, that's not how they read in Scripture. God is saying, do these things because you belong to Christ. That's the point. So while it may not have been immediately obvious to us as I read the text for us this morning, here's what I think the main point is. Treasuring the promises of God motivates our obedience to God because we are convinced that God will provide for us no matter what obedience costs us in this life. 
That's really what this text is all about. All the commands are anchored in what's come before, that Jesus is better. And in this text in particular, these commands are anchored in the promises of God. Let me show you that. First of all, what does life look like in the kingdom of God? First of all, verses 1 to 4, it looks like concern for others. What does that concern for others look like? He shows us. First of all, love for the family of God. He says, let brotherly and sisterly love continue. And this is present tense. Keep on loving each other as brothers and sisters. So we hear the familial language there, brothers and sisters. But calling each other brother and sister is not just a sentimental thing. We don't do that because it gives us the warm and fuzzies. It's anchored in doctrinal truth. Back in chapter 2, he told us that Christ is our elder brother, and he's the one who's not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters. Remember that? And so because, remember, Christ is the unique son of God, he inherits all of the blessings, and he shares them with everyone who trusts in him by grace through faith. That's why we're brothers and sisters. That's why Jesus said, by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's why the Apostle John says, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. The church is the family that has been purchased by Christ. That, that's who this is. That, those who are sitting around you today, that's the forever family of God. That's why. Just think about, here's a practical application. What did Paul tell young Pastor Timothy about how he was to conduct himself in the church, which is what 1 Timothy is all about? He tells him in 1 Timothy 5, treat the older men as fathers. Treat the older women as mothers. Treat the younger women as sisters with all purity. Treat all the younger men as brothers. That's, that's the family of God. The church is the blood-bought family of God. It's comprised, it's made up of those people. Look at the top of your take home, Matthew 10, 39. The church is comprised of those people who believe that to lose their lives for Christ's sake is to truly find it. Or as David said in Psalm 63, the church is made up of those people who believe that the steadfast love of God is better than life. That's why we serve others. Do you see? That's, that's how all these commands hold together. That's why this is not works salvation. The reason we live this way is because we have come to believe, because God has changed our hearts, that to live for God and to serve others is better than a life focused solely on yourself. Do you know that? That's the point. And so because we believe that then, the question we should wake up, and we're all sinners, we don't do this every day, I don't do this every day. <laughs> But if I really believe the promises of God, then I'll wake up in the morning and I won't ask myself, who can serve me today? Who, who in this house can make my life easier? No, who, who can I love and serve today? If you do that in even a small measure, that's a sign. If, if because of who we are by nature, if you wake up in the morning and you say, who can I love and serve today? That's evidence that God is at work in your life because that's not who we are by nature. That's the first thing, life in the kingdom of God. We love the family of God. Secondly, verse 2, life in the kingdom of God means extending generosity toward those in need. You see it there. He says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. The word stranger there simply means someone you don't know. And it could be either a believer or an unbeliever. But the point is, the community of love that is the church in a local body spreads out and shares that love with others. In the first century, what he's talking about here most likely would have been itinerant evangelists, those who were passing through a particular city and needed a place to stay overnight. And the writer is saying, you as a child of God, you should, be, you should exhibit a big-hearted welcome to them. But even that is not just a bare exhortation because in Romans 15, Paul says, welcome others as Christ has welcomed you. You see how he anchors it in the gospel? So he's saying there should be a generosity to God's people. You notice in the rest of the verse here, it's, it's, we wonder, what does this mean? He says, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. It's a reference to Genesis 18, where Abraham extended hospitality to people that eventually turned out to be that they were actually angels. Now, you're free to do your own research on this and not agree with what I'm about to say, but I don't think that the purpose of this command is to say, here, do this because you might, you might be able to minister to an angel. 
you should, you should show hospitality because then you, it might lead to a wonderful little spiritual little experience there. No, I think the point is be exemplary at hospitality like Abraham was. Why would we do this? Because we believe that living for ourselves is a dead end. That's what, we've come to see that life focused on God and others is the best kind of life. So he's saying generous hospitality is better than unbelieving stinginess. Why unbelieving stinginess? Because unbelief can reveal itself in a number of ways. It could be, uh, again, I wake up in the morning, I say, uh, why would I show hospitality to others? Hey, why doesn't anyone ever show hospitality to me? That's unbelief. It's unbelieving cynicism. Or unbelief might show up and I can't, I can't show hospitality to everyone. What if there's nothing left over for me? Now, again, we have to be wise in the way we use our money, but we trust that God will provide for us, especially if he's the one impressing upon our hearts that he wants us to do something. So the point is that we care for others. He says, thirdly, in verse 3, life in the kingdom of God looks like extending compassion to the marginalized and the mistreated. He says, remember those who are in prison. Not remember in the sense that, you know, think really hard of what it might be like to be in prison. The, the word remember there is um, do something about it. Actively seek to meet their needs. You know that's what he means because he goes on to say, as though in prison with them. Now, most likely he's referring to uh, those who've been put in prison unjustly simply because of their profession of faith in Christ. That's most likely the case. And remember, as we saw in a previous message, uh, prison in the first century was harsh. It, it, you didn't even have your basic needs met. You, didn't, you, you had to have somebody provide your clothes, someone provide your food, and someone to give you even the basic you know, hygiene products. It would have been someone's family, but because by trusting in Christ, their families have disowned them, not even their biological families are going to associate with them. They were totally dependent on the church family. So he's saying, demonstrate your compassion for these people by meeting their needs. And they would have been considered the marginalized because they were outcasts. He says the people of God care for those who are in that position. Not just the marginalized, but also the mistreated. He says, and those who are mistreated. The word there means uh, abused. In some cases, uh, tormented. Care for those who have been abused, those who are tormented. Why? Since you also are in the body. Meaning, there should be a shared sense of humanity. He's, he's basically saying, care for other human beings because you're a human being. Especially those who have been abused. And the word here, it means all kinds of abuse. It could be physical abuse. It could be sexual abuse. It could be child, young children who are taken advantage of, victims of sex trafficking, and yes, the slaughter of the innocent in the womb. The church is to be the theological conscience of a society. That's why I couldn't agree. This is one of the best quotes I've read in a while from theologian James Edwards. He said, the test of all theology and morality is either passed or failed by one's response to the weakest and most defenseless members of society. I hope you know that, and I hope you believe that. But again, you see the outward focus of God. Why would we do this? Because caring for others with this shared sense of humanity is better. That's what we've come to believe. It is better than a life given over to selfish preoccupation. A selfish self-preoccupation. Number four, what does life in the kingdom of God look like? It looks like celebrating the sacredness of marriage. In the first century, there were basically two views of marriage. On the one hand, you had those who viewed marriage as basically an inferior kind of life. The ascetics, uh, they, they thought that to be truly spiritual, right, the truly spiritual people are those who are celibate. And since they saw the physical body as bad, they viewed sex as a dishonorable act. And again, since the body was bad, you wouldn't want to have children because that would just be to bring more embodied creatures into the world. And that's a bad thing. That's not what we want. That's one view. On the other end of the spectrum is something more like we have today, which those who believe that there should be no boundaries at all whatsoever to sexual expression. Sex outside of marriage is fine. 
Adultery, fine. Same-sex sexual relations, fine. If it feels good, do it. But notice the text says here, let marriage be held in honor. The word there means precious. Uh, celebrated, held in high esteem. And you notice he says, this should be done among all, meaning including the unmarried. Why? Because God is saying, when we're talking about marriage, we're talking to the entire church because God is telling us what he wants us as his people to value, what we are to esteem. What is it? It's marriage. So how are we to esteem it? The text tells us, let the marriage bed be undefiled. Now you need to know here, the, the phrase there, marriage bed, is a euphemism. And it is a euphemism for sexual intercourse. That's what it means. He's saying, yes, this is the Holy Bible, the Holy Spirit saying that we as the church are to hold up sexual intercourse in the context of marriage as something that is precious, something that we esteem. Why? Because it is honorable. That's what he's showing us. Okay, so if it's honorable, what defiles it? We don't have to wonder because the text tells us. What defiles it? Three things in particular. One, he says, the three things are in two, you can see them in two words here. First of all, and the first one is sexual immorality. What defiles sexual intercourse? Sexual immorality, pornea. It refers to all kinds of sexual sin, but in particular, two are in view here. One is fornication. There's an old word. Sex outside of marriage. That is, that is a dishonorable act, according to the Bible. Also, same-sex relations. It's the same word here, pornea, refers to that. Same-sex sexual relations, according to the Bible, is a dishonorable act. There's the third thing. I know we're not going to be applauded for this, by the way. Thirdly is adultery. Sex between a married person with someone they're not married to. What is it? God is saying here, notice this, as you make your way to the new heavens and the new earth and deal with all kinds of troubles and uh, persecution, God says, don't celebrate these things. This, these are dishonorable acts. Instead, celebrate God's design for marriage. What is God's design for marriage? I've said this many times and I'll keep saying it. Marriage is neither a human invention nor a social convention. Marriage is a creation ordinance. It makes complete sense that he, he goes into marriage right after he said, care for those also who are in the body. There's a shared sense of humanity and Christian theology. The Bible is creation affirming. Creation is good and the created order is good. So therefore, marriage is a creation ordinance. It is a man and a woman who leave their family of origin, unite together and start a family. God says, esteem this, celebrate this, uphold this. Why? Because it's sacred. So we celebrate and uphold biblical marriage because we believe it is better than a life of self-worship. Say, Joe, why are you calling it self-worship? Because in Romans chapter 1, when Paul talks about uh, all the various sins that people are committing, he refers to all unbiblical sex as the creature uh, worshiping themselves. It calls it the worship of creation rather than the worship of the creator. So therefore, life in the kingdom of God, what does it look like? It looks like concern for others, love for the family of God, generosity toward those in need, compassion for the marginalized and mistreated, and celebrating the sacredness of marriage. Now, what is it about life in the kingdom of God that would free us from a life of self-concern to be given over to serving God? What frees us to live in line with the values of the kingdom? Notice how the logic of the text here. What frees us to live like this is contentment in God and confidence in God. Look at verses 5 and 6. Contentment and confidence in God. First of all, verse 5 Trust in the promises of God fuels our externally focused life. Keep your life free from the love of money. Let's get that on the record. The problem isn't money. It's love of money that is the problem because 
the love of money is really talking about trusting in money, finding your sense of identity and your security in money. And we're to love God supremely. We're to believe that love, the love of God, is what, what satisfies us. God's love is better than life. And God is telling us to not place our trust in something that is unstable. Remember, the, uh, one of the Psalms says, if riches increase, do not set your heart on them. But notice, rather than loving or trusting in money for our stability and security, he says, be content with what you have. Then he cites Joshua 1.5, for God has promised, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. So notice this in context. The, the command there, be content with what you have, because he goes on to cite Joshua 1.5, is him really saying, be content with God. Be content with God. The way to be free from the love of money is to know and believe and be satisfied in God. Do, do you see the, the logic here? Our, our, our thought process should go something like this. If God will never leave me nor, nor forsake me, then I don't need to crave money. I don't need to find my security and identity in money because that's not the source of my security. God has promised to meet every need. So do you notice? It's his promise that motivates us to live this way. That frees us for a life of generosity. Think of what we've already seen, because you can elaborate, you can expand here. What he's really showing us is that no amount of money, no amount of earthly success, no earthly romance, no sex, none of it compares with the promises of God. But you see, it's believing that promise that frees you. It's what breaks the shackles off of trying to find your sense of security in anything other than God. It's all, it can't satisfy us. That's why I keep going back to Matthew 10, 39. Do we believe Jesus when he said, whoever finds his life will lose it? And whoever finds his life for my, whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do we believe that? That's what breaks the power of living for yourself. If we do believe that, then the next point follows. Look at verse six. Trust in the promises of God breeds a godly defiance. There is a defiance here. We can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Psalm 118, verse 6. But we have to see what this means here. Because from one perspective, right, you could, you could imagine this pastor writing this, this letter to the church and saying to them, don't you know what Psalm 118, 6 says? The Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? And somebody in this persecuted congregation might say, hey, you know what? Quite a lot. They could do a lot to me. They can put me in prison and persecute me, which is what they have done. They can seize my property, which they have done. I can lose my job, which has happened. My family can abandon me, and they have. And you've already told us, they might say, that some of the saints in the Old Testament were left destitute and afflicted and sawn in two. Sounds like they can do a lot to me. So do you see how there's a kind of godly defiance here? What can man do to me? The, the author would say in the rest of the Bible tells us, Jesus told you to not fear those who can only kill the body, but can do nothing to the soul. So what can man do to me? They can kill me, but Jesus said that he who believes in me shall never die. What can man do to me? They can kill me, but they can't separate me from the love of God. They can kill me, but since God is the one who says he's orchestrating all the details of my life and nothing can happen to me unless he has a plan and purpose for it, I can rest in him. And for the Christian, death is not a defeat, but it's a victory. Let me give you an example from church history. This is what has been widely cited in a number of church history books. It has to do with one of the early church fathers, John Chrysostom. He was brought before the Roman emperor Arcadius and his wife Eudoxia, and they were threatening him with banishment. And so, again, this is just a summary. There was a discussion between the emperor and John Chrysostom. And the emperor said, if you don't stop it with all this preaching, we're going to banish you. And Chrysostom said, you, can, you can't banish me. This is my father's house. The emperor said, well, then we're going to kill you. He said, my life is hidden with Christ and God. 
The emperor said, well, then we'll deprive you of all your earthly treasures. Chrysostom said, my treasure is in heaven. The emperor said, well, then I'll drive you away from all of your family and friends and you'll be forced to live alone. He said, you can. I have a friend in heaven from whom you can never separate me. Therefore, he, Chrysostom concluded, I defy you for there is nothing you can do to me. That's, that's the Christian heritage. That's what we mean. So what does this mean? What does it look like? Well, because God has rescued us from a life of sin and self-destruction, that's what it is, to live apart from God, to live a life of sin, is to essentially pursue your own ruin. That's why C.S. Lewis said, a life of sin isn't just wrong, it's dumb. Since God has freed us from a life of sin and self-destruction, our lives are now given over to a life of sacrificial love toward others, which arises out of our satisfaction in God and our supreme confidence that God will always keep his promises. It's to believe that Jesus is better and not just better than Moses and Joshua and the old covenant law and all the Old Testament saints listed in chapter 11. Jesus is better than a life centered on yourself. That's what takes the real work of the Holy Spirit. That's what we have to really see. To, to believe, I mean, this guy's telling his congregation, it would be foolish to abandon Christ for any of his forerunners or rivals. But for us today, I'm saying it would be foolish for us to abandon Christ for the sake of the quote-unquote American dream. It would be foolish to abandon Christ for a life of selfishness. It would be foolish to abandon Christ for your own self-constructed definition of the good life, which I can assure you from experience will lead to a miserable existence. It would be foolish to abandon Christ for some social cause built on lies and half-truths. The promises of living for yourself are flimsy and they do not compare to the rock-solid promises of God. That, that's what he's telling us here. Young people, Jesus is better than the promises of money and fame and popularity. Jesus is better than a life of kicking and screaming and trying to do your best to be a social media influencer. And I only say that because in a recent survey, that's what uh, the younger generation is saying. What, what's their, dream, their dream, dream job? Is to be a YouTuber. I apologize if that's your dream here. Um, being satisfied, there is a, I should say, that was a cheap shot. I should say that you could do that in a godly way. There would be a possible way to do that in godly, but I have my suspicions. Um, you see, Satan would have us believe that living for ourselves would lead to joy, but it won't. Satan would have us believe that a life of defining sex any way you want is the good life but it's not. That money will lead to the good life, but it won't. So again, what is God doing here in this passage? Do you see, once again, this is God coming to our rescue. This is God helping us see that everything that our culture wants to believe, wants us to believe, does not work. Looking inside yourself and trying to find your quote-unquote true self and authentic self and then pursuing it and saying, I don't care about what anyone says, I'm going to quote-unquote be me, right? We even have it in a song, right? This is me. Watch out, because here I come. Sounds like satanic gibberish. Jesus is saying, whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Do you see, treasuring the promises of God is what motivates our life of obedience because we have to believe deep down, we have to become convinced that God will provide for us no matter what obedience costs in this life. His promises are better. So what do we need to do? I'm not giving you anything to do. This is a call to prayer. That's what this is. Ask God to satisfy you each day. Do you think of the psalmist says, one of the prayers of the psalmist, satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. I mean, do you see? That, that's a prayer, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a call to experience something. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love. That's what frees you from the bondage of being fascinated with your, yourself. You say, I could hear somebody saying today, I would love to do that, Joe, but I don't even know how to do that. I can't. I would love to be able to pray that, but I can't because it would seem disingenuous. It would seem disingenuous. I can't pray that. Can you fall on your knees, though, before God 
and tell him you need him. Even if you don't know how to voice it. Even if you say, I'm not sure I even know how to pray that. Can you, can you fall on your knees and just confess your need for him? The old hymn, Come ye sinners, poor and needy. The last stanza says, Let not conscience make you linger, nor of fitness fondly dream. All the fitness he requireth is to feel your need of him. You get that? To feel your need for God is already evidence that God is at work in you because by nature we don't even desire God. So if you have even an inkling to move toward him today, that's a sign that God is at work in your life. And he'll show you that he can satisfy all of your deepest thirsts. And he'll show you that a life lived for his honor and glory and in service to others is the true good life. It's really the life you've always wanted. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that a life poured out in service to you is a life that leads to abiding joy. So Lord, help us to see that our desire for joy and our desire to bring you honor and glory are actually not opposed to one another. You show us that you are the one who can satisfy all of our deepest desires. And it comes to us by pouring out our lives to you, by giving our lives over to you and saying that we don't want to live for ourselves anymore. That's a dead end. Some of us here know that experientially. Others of us, perhaps sitting here, are thinking to themselves, Pastor Joe is lying. He's not telling the truth. Lord, for those who may be in that position, who may be in that place, who may be saying those words to themselves, I pray, we pray that you would do what only you can do, which is to transform hearts, to remove the heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, the one that desires to love you and to serve you. Lord, we believe that you can do it because you are the one who created all things. And the power on display in creation is the same power on display in the work of regeneration. And so, Lord, we know that you can say to the dead, live. So do that work, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.